We are here and we are doing an oral history project for Natick veterans. And I want to thank you for doing this. This is for a project that I'm working on for my graduate program um, in education. And if you just very briefly introduce yourself, sort of where you're from, and then we'll go from there. My name is David Wall. I was born in Woburn, Massachusetts, um, as was my father and grandfather. And where did you go to school growing up? I went to a Catholic grammar school called St. Charles Grammar School, Woburn, followed by Keith Academy in Lowell, and then off to uh, St. Anselm's College all Catholic colleges, and I never had a woman in my class until my junior year in college, and I ended up marrying her. That's a great story. <laughs> We're going to talk more about that in a little bit, too. <laughs> so when did you decide that you wanted to enlist in the military? About the time that you started St. A's, around the time that you were at least... No, I, I gave no thought to it probably until my junior year. Junior year. Yeah, when I was inundated with... Uh, pressure from some people around the college to, to, to decide to do something when you graduate. I, as I was a sociology major and uh, I, was, I was prime draft bait. And so you decided to enlist? Yes. To enlist. Um, did St. A's have an ROTC program or how did you? They did not have an ROTC program, but they had some, the Marines they had something called the PLC program, which is Platoon Leaders Corps. Mm -hmm. And um, it was not sponsored by the college, but many, many of the uh, college students participated in a similar type program. But St. A's, unlike like Holy Cross and places like that, did not have an on-campus OCS or ROTC program. So when you were going through this particular program, what was your major at the time at St. A's? By the time I got to the decision to joined the Marine Corps, I was a sociology major, having failed as a medical major. <laughs> Pre-med? Pre-med. Pre-med. Any other classmates of yours joining the military at that time as well? Yes, many. Many? Uh, and maybe a dozen or so. Yeah, across the branches? Across the branches, uh, upon graduation. Mm -hmm. upon but graduation. they only commissioned three of us graduation, uh, which is kind of a grand event. Absolutely, absolutely. And you chose to enlist in the Marines. Correct. Why the Marines? Call it my roommate was in the PLC program. Uh, Walter Gallo ran the alumni mm -hmm. program at St. A's, was a Marine. Um, and there were a number of friends of mine who were upperclassmen who had committed to join the Marine Corps. And it seemed like the right thing to do. Uh, a great way to beat the draft was to join the Marine Corps. Kind of paradoxical. But so when you began this process, where did you do your basic training and your officer's training? Quantico, Virginia, just okay. outside of Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Talk to me about your experience at Quantico. That must have been a difficult thing for a young man it, in college. It, well, it was difficult because you brought 750 people from different walks of life together, all with different attitudes, different accents, different education mm -hmm. backgrounds. And what the Marine Corps tends to do is try and wash all that away and, and get you in a, in, a, in a kind of a universal mindset. Uh, so it was tough. Physically, it was very tough for me. Uh, I was not in great physical shape when I went down there. and I think in, in 12 weeks, I must have lost about 20 pounds. Was it the physical aspect more difficult than the mental aspect of basic training for you? For me, it was more physical. Mm -hmm. um, for 18-year-olds, 17, 8-year-olds, it's much more emotional and mental. It, it really is. We were more mature. We, we, we could see the light at the end of the tunnel as becoming an officer. Um, the only overshadowing mm -hmm. event during that time is you knew that 99 out of 100 of us were going to go to Vietnam. Right. So what did you do to sort of get each other through basic training, knowing that you had the light at the end of the tunnel of I kept my mouth shut, uh, worked as hard as I possibly could, yeah. tried to blend in as best I could. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you specifically is, did you learn any languages as part of your military training? Not in OCS. Not in OCS. However, because I had taken six years of Latin, high school and college, and two years of French, I had developed an aptitude for it. So before, after OCS and then officer basic training, mm -hmm. which is another six months, they sent me to a Vietnamese language school in California. In California which helped me, still helps me today because I, 
I've been back to Vietnam 13 times. Absolutely. Any other languages aside from Vietnamese that you spoke? No. No? Latin. Yeah. If that counts. <laughs> Any French at all when you were I, in country? The only French I know is enough to get me yeah. slapped. But it was the Vietnamese. It was Vietnamese. That got right? you through. Um, were you married when you enlisted? No. No. I, Any... didn't, I did not get married until I finished artillery school when I was in Virginia. And uh, my commanding officer said to me, I have good news and bad news. He said, the good news is you're going to Vietnamese language school. The bad news is you're going to Vietnam. And uh, three weeks later, I got married. Where did you and your wife, Jerry, live once you began active duty? Monterey, California. Monterey, California? Yeah, that's the... Uh, On base? Uh, no. No? Uh, that's Viet Vietnamese language school. Okay. Was off base. We lived in the Monterey Peninsula for three months. Any children at that time? No. No. Let's see. So when exactly did you serve in Vietnam? What were the dates of your tour or tours? March of 67 to April of 68. 13 months. For some strange reason, the Marines did 13 months. The Army only did 12. Where were you um, in country, specifically in Vietnam? In a place called I Corps, which was uh, the northern section of the southern part of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. There were four corps, one, two, three, and four. And the, one, the first corps, they called it I Corps. That was 90% uh, was uh, staffed by the Marine Corps. Okay. Were you infantry, artillery? Artillery. 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 What was your specific duties in the artillery? Initially, as a forward observer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the role of a full observer is to go out with the infantry and, uh, and, and be able to provide uh, on-call artillery fires in the event of ambushes or things of that nature. I did that for about four months. Then because I was delayed going to Vietnam, I got promoted early to first lieutenant. They pulled me out of the, the full the FO's job and made me an uh, artillery battery executive officer. Did you ever see any major action, any major battles when you were in Vietnam? No, not, none of the, well, I was in a lot of operations, oh, but okay. what happens is that you're a small fish in a big pond. You don't realize what's going on around you. All you do is you're more focused on that small unit right. and you're doing the job as best you can and surviving. Were you ever injured? Not, not sufficient to get a Purple Heart. I, Got knocked down a few times, rolled around, concussion type things, but uh, never drew any blood. Anything that you still still deal with on a daily basis? That's a good question from because I have injured? a twenty I have a twenty percent disability from the VA, ten percent for hearing, mm -hmm. and they gave me ten percent for PTSD. And I asked them why, and they said, w "Were you ever shot at?" And I said, "Yes." Were you ever afraid? Yes. Do you ever have any bad dreams? I said. Yeah, once in a while, 10%. So. Yeah. So, what were some of the most trying days that you had or experiences when you were serving in Vietnam? I think the fear associated with being in the jungle and not knowing you know, mm -hmm. whether you're going to get ambushed or not, mm -hmm. or whether you get shot or not. Right. So, there was a high level of anxiety. Uh, throughout that. That's one issue. The other issue was uh, towards the end of my tour, I got promoted to captain, became an artillery battery commander and responsible for 212 troops. And sometimes we had fire missions that would go all night long and resupplying ammunition. Um, uh, that was stressful. What were some of the conditions that led to that? I mean, the, just the weather and the landscape you were dealing with. What about the types of equipment that you needed to use? Was I mean, that was all provided by the military. I mean, right. And, and the weather was crazy. You know, right. 13 months, you had monsoons for mm -hmm. four or five months, you know, where you were soaked all the time. And, and you had, you know, 105, 110 degrees temperatures. So, I mean, it, but I was young. I was 22, 23 years old. You know, I, today I'd be in the hospital if I had to, <laughs> that, I had to go through that again. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I went... Uh, I think I went about 17 or 18 days without a hot meal. 
And, and one night a helicopter came in to bring some ammunition. They had large vat cans of uh, hot cream of split pea soup. And I drank about a gallon of it. <laughs> that, was little, only, that was the only hot food I had in The about little pleasures, days. right? The little pleasures yeah. when you're serving. That's right. Did you ever lose anybody close to you? Pardon? Did you ever lose anybody yes. close yes, to you? Yes, some of my, some of my artillery get killed. You know, in, in the, the Tet Offensive in 1968, we took a lot of incoming rockets. And I had some very close young men that I had been with for six or seven months that got killed. That were serving under you at the time? Yeah. Yeah. That could not have been an easy experience. It wasn't because in one case, we, we were all running for a bunker and these two, these one kid I mean, when Meta, Bobby Meta, could outrun me and he, he, he ran ahead of me. When the rocket came in, it, it landed between the two of us mm -hmm. and the shrapnel went in one direction, concussion went in the other. I get flipped around, knocked down, rolled over in the sand, nothing happened to me. He got a piece of shrapnel in the back of his head and died. And I, I can still see that happening. To this day, I can still visualize. I forgot what I had for lunch today, but I'll never forget that that moment in 1968. I can, I can imagine. I can only imagine. Do you still do you talk to contemporaries of yours? I do. I've gone to a number of military-oriented organizations, mm -hmm. and we swap stories back and forth all the time. And, and you know, given that we're seniors now, you can tell the same story two or three times, and they all think it's new. <laughs> I want to get to that in more detail in a little bit, okay. but I also wanted to ask you, did you ever bump into any of your St. A's friends, your college friends in country? Yes, I did, as a matter of fact. Um, well, Jack Duty was my college roommate. I ran into him one, just, just one time, and uh, at another time, a helicopter landed in our, in our um, battery area. And the pilot was Vic Demarier, a classmate of ours yeah. in Connecticut. Uh, and I, I bought to a few other St. A's guys who were more senior to me, but uh, seeing seeing Vic was kind of a shock. It's like, what are you doing here? Well, I, mean, I knew he was a helicopter pilot. Yeah. I didn't expect to see him. He was unloading ammunition, and I forget what else he was doing. But uh, all of a sudden, the helicopter lands, and the ramp goes down, and out comes Vic. So, that must have been amazing. It was. It was kind yeah. of exciting. Did he have any, as a helicopter pilot, any mishaps? Did he have any mishaps? That, Did he? Yes. Somebody has planted this question for you, I think. Possibly. Possibly. I think he crashed his helicopter at least two times, possibly three. Yeah. And walked away. And walked away. Physically uninjured. Emotionally injured. It's amazing. Well, I mean... In fact, I think one of the times the helicopter burned up, I vaguely remember that story. But, uh, and we've seen Vic. Mm -hmm. as, I mean, as, 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 um, he's come back to reunions and, and we stay in contact with him. Good. I'm glad you do. I'm glad you do. Do you personally have any commendations as a result of your service? Not personal. I've got unit commendations. Unit commendations. Yeah. See, one of the, one of the problems with forward observers is that they were, their parent unit was miles and miles and miles away. So their commanding officers weren't anywhere near you. You were kind of rented to the infantry. And very frankly, the infantry commanders took special care to take care of their own infantry lieutenants. So while I participated in major operations and went on patrols and was in a lot of, of action, if you will, uh, I, I, I did my job and nothing mm -hmm. that would bring it to the level of a personal commendation. As you were um, serving in Vietnam and as you were getting promoted, how did you personally stay abreast of all the important news that was going on at the time? What was the communication like? Well, we had Armed Forces Radio mm -hmm. and, uh, and we would get a, a military publication periodically, mm -hmm. but very frankly, we were kind of out of it. I mean, any communication from but, home, but, letters, or oh well, yeah, get get plenty of letters. Yeah. I mean, get plenty of letters. But the Marines, where we were stationed, was so far into the jungle and the woods that you get very poor communication. I mean, I mean, uh, I never saw a television, mm -hmm. you know, or anything like that, uh, except back in the rare area. Um, people had transistor radios, but you just couldn't. 
nothing was projected that far. Um, so it was it was unusual to, to be brought up to speed with what was happening back in the States or what the attitude was of our right. politicians, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think any of that was intentional? Good question. On that's behalf a, of the that's a policy question. At the time? But, yeah, I don't really know. I mean, we were just trying to live day by day by right. day. I mean, the closest thing to information is is briefings from commanding officers periodically on tactical operations, not even strategic issues, not even national issues. It's just um, this program we're going to we're going to be doing A, B, C, and D, and this unit is going to be with that unit. This is your mission. Blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. so we were kind of a, in an in a informational blackout. Did you, on your downtime, when were you ever off duty, did you ever do anything for fun? Yeah, there's a unit or a group, anything on base, or was it? Well, first of all, we weren't on base. No. We were in the jungle okay. and, right. and, and outpost. The closest thing you had is volleyball, that's all. Uh, and they they would have an officers and staff NCO tent, and you can go in and get, you can drink warm beer and eat peanuts yep. and tell lies, but that's all. I mean, um, we didn't see movies. Or no. Like that. We were probably all the time, maybe in between 30 and 50 miles west of the big centers like Da Nang and places like that. And, um, so you were much more isolated than, than isolated. other people that Most were the time in country. Most of the the uh, Laotian and Cambodian borders. Right. Right. So I also wanted to ask you, we're, we're going to transition a little bit into what you're doing now, but when were, did you leave service? When were you? 1992. Okay. Um, I stayed in, I, I, I did four and a half years of active duty. Mm -hmm. Normally, it would have been three and a half. But when I came back from Vietnam, I only had about three months left to do before my three years was up. And I met a fellow from Woburn, Massachusetts at Quantico, and he said, I'll tell you what, he said, I, I can get you stationed up in Massachusetts if you want, but you have to spend an extra year in active duty. I had nothing else to do, so, uh, and my wife was from Providence, so I went to Providence, Rhode Island for a year, to a, to a reserve artillery unit. Uh, but what I didn't realize was that was only the, the primary mission of this unit, mm -hmm. was to train reservists. And they had a major up there who was responsible for the unit, and I was a captain, so I did casualty calls for a year. I made 30 three casualty calls on families whose sons had been either killed or wounded. Actually, one MIA, one WIA, and the rest all KIAs. And the Marine Corps and the Navy at that time, uh, it was their protocol to, to be the first one to knock on the door. Mm -hmm. The Army and the Air Force would send a telegraph or a telegram and follow it up with a casualty notification officer. But we didn't do that. So I had so to go in knocking on doors. They, you'd, get, you'd get a message from headquarters Marine Corps and we'd have to go make that call within 12 hours. And every family you visited was a Marine family? Every single one. Every single one. Marine family. It takes a very, I think, very special person to do that. And you know, you, just, those you, you have members. to do it. What I would do is I'd take a staff NCO with me, and I'd find a chaplain, because mm -hmm. we'd get a message, and we'd know what the religion was of the person. And the three of us were given in my staff car, and we'd go out and knock on the doors and I'd just pick the pieces up, help the families with funeral arrangements, um, you know, conduct the funeral itself, yeah. the 21-gun salutes, um, things of that nature. If you if you look up in back, you're going to see a flag and a case up there. That's the flag that um, will be on my casket at some yeah. point in time. But I used to present that flag to the wives and the mothers. Uh, I had one woman take the flag out of my hand, throw it, and jump over the over the rope and down onto the grave and top of her son's casket. Frightening. It sounds very frightening, but it's just emotion. You can't even imagine what emotions people are feeling when they're experiencing something like that. I can only imagine. I had one WIA, uh, Crescent MIA, missing in action, who eventually ended up in the Hanoi Hilton, and he did come home. He, fi he finally did come home after six years. Had he not been picked up by the VC, he'd probably been court martialed. He was just swimming in a river he was not supposed to be in. Uh current swept him downstream, he caught an ambush. But it was still a very happy time when he came home. He was only like 26 when he came home. 
a whole life ahead of them. Absolutely. $50,000 in back pay. and. Uh, I think people forget that the average age of the soldier in Vietnam was 19. It's the average Enlisted. Age. Enlisted. Enlisted. Yes. Uh, officers are probably about 23, 24. Do you think that impacted how, I mean, how did you feel upon your return and how these, these men and, and women in some cases, but most of them were coming back to the United States after they served? You know, I, I, I never saw any of the vitriol that many people saw. I never, nobody ever threw anything at me. My biggest shock came back in the United States. Sounds crazy. It was it was seeing girls with skirts up to here because <laughs> when I left, they were down to here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I never caught get caught up in the political maelstrom of of some of the things like John Kerry and, and people like that mm -hmm. and threw their medals away. I, I never I never saw anything like that. Not me personally. Not you personally. No. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of the tours that you conduct on a regular basis on historic military right. sites. You do mostly in Europe and Asia. Yes. So talk to me a little bit about that. Some of the places you most frequent and some of the battle sites that you most frequent. Well, I've, and who you I've, take done, over. I've done 13 tours back to Vietnam and we take back veterans and their families mm -hmm. and educators and people who just want to see the country because it's a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. The English is taught in every single school. Mm -hmm. While it's communist, it's communist in politics only. Uh, it's, you know, everybody's working. The hotels are great, the food's great. So, in fact, I'm doing that again in, in uh, January. Do you sp still speak Vietnamese when you travel? Uh, I Vietnam, like in Vietnam, a little bit. A little that bit? means I speak Vietnamese a little bit. <laughs> um, I've done three tours to Ireland, two to France, three to Korea, one to Spain. Uh, I'm headed to Vietnam in January. I'm heading to Iwo Jima in the South Pacific in March. And I'm taking a group back to all Ireland in September, both southern section and the northern section. It must be amazing to bring veterans and their families back so they can experience and see the sites where their family members actually. A lot of, a lot of men will bring their, their, their children. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and we have women come back. I've, take, I've taken Army nurses mm -hmm. back. I've taken Navy nurses back. Um, and mm -hmm. great catharsis, quite honest. And uh, in, I, bet I've, I bet I've taken back over 200 Marines, and I've only had one problem where the guy's PTSD was so bad. We had a, he was a drunk. We had to put him on a plane and send him home. Out of oh, well over 200. So my wife's been to Vietnam with me. I, I was going to ask if she's, she's been. been. She's been to France with me. Mm -hmm. She's been to Ireland with me. And she must, that must be an amazing experience for her, too, not only just seeing those historic sites, but seeing you interact with the, your fellow veterans and how well, meaningful it is. Well, you know, she's heard me tell stories about this place and that place for years now. I've taken her to all those places. Mm -hmm. I've taken her to the jungle out place. I've taken her to the big cities and things like that. Why Ireland? Why Ireland? I think we can I understand France and I understand Vietnam because and Iwo Jima. Between 1942 and 19, in June 1944, we had 300,000 American troops training in Vietnam. We had six army divisions. We had 20,000 Army Air Corps teaching the Brits how to fly anti-submarine wars, planes. We had 2,000 sailors repairing ships. We had 600 Marines. And by June 1944, most of them were all gone. They either went to Europe, to the, uh, you know, the, to uh, Operation Overlord on Normandy, or they went down to uh, Africa and Operation Torch. Mm -hmm. The Marines there, uh, many of them went to Iwo Jima and never came back. That's true. That's amazing. It is amazing. It, it, well, we had just, about 3,800 Marines Those killed, numbers, killed absolutely. Them. Yeah. I think it's important that you're bringing people to, back to remind them of that sacrifice for sure. I know you personally haven't received any commendations, but I thought it was an interesting point. Um, have you ever met a Congressional Medal of Honor winner? Well, a friend of mine just died today, Tom Hudner. Absolute Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, if, you read, if you read the Boston Globe today, it was a big write-up about Captain Hud Hudner. Mm -hmm. so I, I, and, and also, as, as, uh, as your dad knows, mm -hmm. we had uh, uh, Harvey C. Barney Barnum, mm -hmm. a classmate of ours at St. Anselm's, who received the Medal of Honor. That must be amazing to have people, contemporaries of yours, be honored it, in such a way. It is, it is. And he, he did two tours in Vietnam and uh, rose to the rank of colonel. 
Um, and we see him periodically at college functions. I've known him through two wives and 30 years. And you still remain close, which is? Yeah, do we exchange emails, et cetera, et cetera. That's excellent. So what did you do for employment once you left the military? We'll sort of wrap up with this. I went, I, I could involve commercial banking. I uh, went back and got a master's degree, an MBA, and um, worked for a number of commercial banks in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts. Um, and I'd say that was two thirds of my of my civilian career, and then I got on the wrong side of a bank merger, lost my job, but I was high enough up so they had to give me a year's salary, and I went to work for a consulting company and did management consulting, basically uh, working with bankruptcy courts and helping to run companies through, through the bankruptcy process. Um, and when I hit 62, I took my Social Security, I had a Marine Corps benefit, I had a pension, I had, I had invested all, every bit of my money I could when I was in the, in the career in, in uh, stocks and bonds and, and things of that nature. So I had three sources of income and I just quit, went to New Hampshire, bought a, built a home up in New Hampshire and I played around the real estate mm -hmm. business, commercial real estate for a while and then sold it and came down to, back down to New Hampshire. And now we've just moved into Methuen, Mass to be very close to our children. And grandchildren and good friends and like good, your dad and good friends absolutely so i'll let you sort of have the last words and what would you want people watching this to take away what would you like to say to fellow veterans or what would you want people to most ask a veteran about or how would you like them to be thanked for their service that's kind of a multifaceted yes. question um Got to think about that for a moment. Sure. Uh, well, well, first, first of all, unlike 30, 40 years ago, very, the military service is not something that the that the media and and uh, the world today thinks it's worth participating in. You know, that's we have a serious problem there. I I think um, what I'd like people to do is to recognize the importance sacrifices that are being made by our ancestors mm -hmm. as well as any of us that served because you know to, to quote a hackney term freedom is not free right. you got to pay a price for it and we paid a price for it we really have and uh as, as i look around the shelf and see your dad he put his he, he put his right hand up and swore to support and defend the constitution mm -hmm. and i'd like i'd like to see more people doing that today yeah. i agree well, thank you. There's nothing dishonorable about being in the service. You know, a lot of the eggheads think, you know, you can't get a job, so you're not smart enough to do do something, so you join the service as a cop out. It's not, that's not the case. I mean, I'll tell you what the service teaches you. It teaches you cooperation, mm -hmm. coordination, respect, uh, communication, um, respect for higher authority, uh, comradeship, things that you can't get in an educational situation. Right. Very unique, very unique experience. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, none of my children joined. One of my, my daughters said, I don't like the hairdo daddy, so I'm not gonna go in. Uh, my, my son, by the time he decided he wanted to go in, he was too old. So, um, my father couldn't serve. One of the reasons I joined the Marine Corps, this is important, my father grew up in, the, in World War II Every one of his cousins and uncles and friends joined the service. Mm -hmm. He joined the National Guard, and when it came time to go to war, he was physically unable. He had he contracted arthritis. So I think my father served vicariously through me. Mm -hmm. And when I got commissioned, he had my commissioning miniaturized and laminated and put in his wallet, which he carried around to the day he died. Uh, so I think I made my father very, very proud Absolutely. of joining the service. Absolutely. We make all of us proud by serving. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this. Well, hopefully it'll it'll benefit you at some point along the way. I think it'll benefit a lot of people Good. along the way. All right. Thank you, Dave.